Hi, I'm James DeFritis. And I'm Stan DeFritis, Mr. Green Thumb. And this is another edition of the Ask Mr. Green Thumb TV show. And today we're going to be looking at a lot of bromeliads and a lot of other interesting plants in this area. Come grow with Stan and James DeFritis on the Ask Mr. Green Thumb show. With a multitude of popular plant information, learn how to identify, grow, nourish, and explore the wonderful world of green lush gardens. We hope to enlighten your senses with new ways to plant healthy greenery. You too can get the green thumb blessing. Come grow with Stan and James DeFritis on the Ask Mr. Green Thumb Show. Uh, what do we have here? This whole area is sort of a, a mixture of different types of bromeliads, and there's buku of them. There's mm -hmm. about 30,000, probably 3,400 known species. And when they say known, there's probably more. Oh, I can imagine. Well, now what makes a bromeliad different than, say, other plants that are around this area? Well, they have a very leathery leaf normally. They okay. usually have some serration on the edges. Oh, yeah. I noticed that uh, we've got this kind of almost like a serrated knife kind of thing. Um, and actually, when we were setting up the cameras, uh, you know, my legs kind of noticed it too. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. Um, but uh, really interesting in that it's got this kind of serrated knife looking thing, although it's not that sharp. But I, what's going on with this pink tip? Um, well, why do they do that? Some of them just have a little bit of color on the tips, and of course sometimes they just get a little bit of brown because that's where it will first show up with any kind of stress, uh, usually around the tip and then the edges of a leaf. Mm. But uh, I think just like we pointed out with cacti and succulents, these edges along the side are to keep animals from eating them. Okay, so this is a deterrent. This is a uh, kind of keep me uh, keep the pest away kind of application. That being said, we had a dog once, uh, Monica, and she was going through her puppyhood, and she went out and ate almost all my bromeliads. And I kept thinking, how could she eat them with this leathery leaf with this with this saw's edge? But she had like a fetish for how many bromeliads can I eat? Leave it to a dog to uh, figure out interesting ways to. Uh, to eat interesting stuff. Just the right stuff. But they come in so many different colors. They have kind of a natural pitcher effect in the center where they can hold moisture. Uh -huh. So they can live in really tough conditions. Uh, much like a cactus uh, or other type succulents, these things can really grow in, in uh, desert areas. And you mostly see them in the Americas, um, both Central America, South America. Okay. And, and of course, then so this is a non-native species to Florida, or this well, is something that would have been here already. Most of the native species would probably be more like the uh, the Talansias, which would be the Spanish moss and uh, the ball moss we see oh. on the trees. Okay. Most of the rest of these were introduced from Central America and South America and brought up. Um, when the Europeans came into Central America, the Dutch and uh, some of the others, they went, ah, this is totally unusual. We've never seen it before, and they brought them back and did all kinds of crosses and coming up with new varieties. Oh, interesting. Okay. So they just loved it. And of course, the the pineapple, which we have, uh, became a big uh, crop around the world. Yeah. Uh, when they brought back that brought back to Europe, they said, oh my gosh, this is a tasty, unusual fruit. Huh. And uh, and there again, the, the Dutch thought it was just wonderful. They, they propagated it, took it to other places like Hawaii, and uh, then it became a huge business. Huh, interesting. Now, I'm noticing uh, back on the bromeliad leaf here, there's a lot of these little white specks. Um, what's going on with that? What do you reckon, uh, the, is uh, something attacking this? Or? Yeah, there's, there's always a bunch of insects that sometimes get into them. Uh, sometimes because of the water in the center, okay. it makes like a nice breeding ground for uh, mealybugs and uh, scales, cottony cushion scale. So that's um, most likely what we're dealing with here? Yeah, I okay. would say it is. And of course, sometimes just a hard stream of water will get rid of them first or you can try some of the organic soap pesticides. Uh, those would be your less you know, uh, evasive uh, answers. And then of course, if that didn't work, then you could go to one of the chemicals and that might do it too. Gotcha. Well, we always, uh, on this show, we always like to recommend that uh, people use the most safe products. Right. Uh, most organic that they can. Um, and I noticed on this bromelia down here, we've got like a, uh, a really distinct pink leaf at the tip. Yeah, now many of them will color up very nicely and they're known for either being dark reds or purples. Uh, they come up with all kinds of color combinations uh, other than the all greens, which are nice, but you'll see some different variegations. Oh yeah, there's a variegated one right there growing back there. You'll see a nice variegation back there that's got Beautiful. kind of a pink, white, and uh, the green. Sure, you've got all kind of edging. Remember too that they, uh, 
The little stomatas on them are actually, will often open up at night because they want to conserve moisture. Mm. They're in situations where they can't hold water. Now here, of course, they can. Okay, now you used a very technical term there, stomata. I don't know what that means. Stomata is just a, it's a weep hole for the plant that it can, can exchange water or, or um, gases sometimes. And the plant often does that because it has to regulate itself somewhat like, well, we sweat. The so like an osmosis type of thing? Yeah, the plant water is, is ex you know, it's kind of an exchange of, of fluids. If it's getting a lot of water, it tends to let some of the water out through the stomatas. Okay. And if it's in need, it tends to tighten up those stomatas and says, okay, we're going to hold this water for uh, better times. Wow, that is amazing. So they're, they're an interesting plant in that they can do that. Some of these plants too, the uh, air types uh, of the bromeliads, have very little bit of a root system just kind of to hold it in place. And is that why they get their name, the air bromeliads? They're the air bromeliads. And, okay. um, and, and it's because they don't have as many, uh, they don't have to go into the, the soil as much. No, they can be totally up on a tree or on a wall, like you'll see one over there. Okay. And uh, it's a, actually a, an epiphyte, I meaning it's an air plant. What's an, uh, now another term you've used, epiphyte? An epiphyte would just mean any plant that can live up in the air. Oh, okay. And uh, often they'll attach to the trees where they could get some light up there and they can get water from the, the dews and stuff. And pretty amazingly, they can take in most of that water even through some of the leaf. Wow. Which is pretty amazing because most plants have to develop a really extensive root system. But you look at some of these epiphytes on the wall and it has a very small condensed root system and you're thinking, how does it survive? Hmm. Well, every little bit of dew that comes at night, it kind of pulls in that moisture. And so that's a pretty much of a miracle that a plant can survive on, you know, I've, I found my little spot, you know, 40, 50 feet up in the air, and I can live on this little bit of nothing and, uh, and then bloom. Wow, so the, so the, uh, the bromeliads, the air bromeliads, are uh, as much of a survivor as the beautiful flamingos that are behind us. Yeah, we ought to look at those as well. They are attractive, and they can sleep with one, on one leg. That's right, they can do the one leg. I couldn't do that, but you're younger than me, so you can, <laughs> you can still do the one-legged uh, pose. For now, pose. let's see what happens with time. We have a beautiful, I think you called this a Dracaena. Um, what makes this so unique? It's called Dracaena marginata, and it's okay. got a little margin because a little red along the edges. Oh, that's why they call it that. And uh, that's the name. Sometimes you'll see them in tricolors too, a little bit of white in there. So they'll have a white, red, and green. And uh, Dracaena goes back to meaning Drake, Draco or dragon. Dragon. And you can see the plant has sort of unusual shapes. Mm. And because of that, that's yeah, the name. It seems like it has this like meandering kind of uh, uh, base to it here. And, uh, it's, and it's segmented almost in a crisscross foundation too, which is uh, maybe that's for added strength. It's, yeah, it's kind of a different looking stem and then you can see where it's been cut before and then it breaks again. Mm. So that makes an unusual uh, plant. The more you cut it, the more it breaks and the more unusual twisting shapes you can get. Well, that's neat. Well, and uh, so I like this. This looks like it'd be a really good uh, plant to have in your uh, landscape for a nice talking piece and uh, have a real interesting, uh, uh, unique uh, uh, purple uh, plant behind you there. Yeah, we've got a, a purple salvia or sometimes called purple sage. And uh, it's a large family of a bunch of different colors. You'll see them sometimes in blue and kind of purpley and uh, also sort of a red. So you can get different color combinations at the nursery. Mm -hmm. Makes a nice uh, flowering plant for a good long time, probably spring and summer for the most part. Is that an annual? Yeah, it would be considered an annual. So you're either gonna restart them or get little plants to start again. In some of the warmer areas, it might become a perennial. It might live more than one season, but where you get a hard freeze, it's going to be an annual. Okay, so anytime that that happens, you're, you're going to have to uh, think of having this plant for one season, and then next time you're going to have to have a new one put in. And you can see that all kind of bees and butterflies really love it as a nectar producer. It's sort of a magnet for them. So they'll come to it. You've got it in the yard, you'll start seeing a lot more insect activity. Great. Well, it looks like we're going to look at another really cool, unique 
plant coming up here in just a minute. Let's go. We have a really great plant behind us and it is called the balloon milkweed. So not only does it attract butterflies, but it's also something that is really different. It attracts people. It does. People seem to want to stop at this plant more than any other. And, uh, and you know, it has this beautiful uh, circular shaped sack of, I guess it's just air inside there. It is. It's actually kind of a seed pod. And, um, you know, seed pods we think of can be in so many different shapes and sizes. But this one is a real conversation piece. And of course, as it opens up, insects use it for a food source and that will also help disperse the seeds. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me how plants figure out different ways to get their their uh, next generation spread around the world. But uh, this one of course uh, being a milkweed is a magnet for monarchs. Mm -hmm. And it's a magnet for my face apparently. Well it likes you and uh, it likes me as well. It, it's definitely swaying in the breeze. It is. So uh, certainly this is an unusual plant. You won't see it very often and it's one of the reasons we wanted to show it to you because it's kind of an unusual, interesting plant. Absolutely, just like the Dutchman pipe that we already showed, uh, you don't see a whole lot of plants that create this interesting shape or structure uh, before it, it opens up and has another function uh, either for beauty or, or for you know providing a home for bugs as you pointed out in this plant. Fantastic, and if you like this and you like our show in general, you ought to think about uh, hitting the link button and uh, make sure you become one of our That's regulars. Right. If, you, uh, if you like our show, make sure you hit the subscribe button and uh, make sure you like it. And uh, that way each and every week, you'll automatically be given a notification that uh, we've done something new. It's time to grab your cup of joe and uh, enjoy. Hey Dad, we've got this, uh, well I'm not going to be too favorable about it, um, it looks like a stick. What, what is it? Well it's a young tree, it's a white sapote, and uh, remember when things are juvenile often they want to get up to the sunlight. Probably because it's sort of a semi-shady area, it's elongating even more so. If it were in direct full sun all day, it would be a little more compact. Okay, so it wouldn't be trying to do this long, scraggly looking thing. And it will start to branch more. And it's kind of the nature of the beast for it to, uh, you know, keep reaching out and be tall. And once, if you wanted to, you could actually trim the top of it and it would force it to branch more. Gotcha. Now, now I'm a little curious here. We look like we've had a uh, seagull torpedo this leaf, but you're telling me that that is not a seagull uh, dung. It's called an orange dog caterpillar and um, it's a larval stage of the monarch. And um, though it's very hideous looking and it does look sort of like a bird dropping, mm -hmm. but I think it's like natural defense. If you look like a bird dropping, then other critters don't want to come after you. Gotcha. And then it, it uh, goes through its metamorphosis and it looks just beautiful. Okay, so again, this is sort of a nature's defense of, hey, don't eat me. Don't eat me. Because I'm not anything that's you, that you really would want. And if you touch on the top of its head, two little orange antennae come out. And that also, I think, is sort of a self-defense mechanism. I don't think I'm going to be doing that. Mm -mm. You know, some people think it smells good. Some people say it doesn't smell so good. So there's kind of a point counterpoint on that one. But uh, this white sapote makes a nice uh, a fruit tree. It's from central uh, Mexico. Okay. And uh, there are other varieties. That, so this is uh, going to do really well in the heat. It'll take the heat pretty well. I don't know if I'd want it in the hottest part of the country like the desert. Right, but does it, it seem, need a lot of water? It seems to require a good deal of water, but still a well-draining soil. Okay. Which always is sort of a catch-22. You don't want something that, that uh, you can give water to, but you also want to make sure it doesn't get into a root rot. It's, okay. Some yeah, of the fruit so, trees So like any other tree and plant, you, you want to have something that has good drainage. So I see so many people go out and they buy pots and stuff from their big box store and they don't seem to pay attention to whether or not it actually has little holes in the bottom to let the water out, and then they wonder why their plant dies. So that's, that's a shame to, to buy a tree or plant and then not have it uh, exist because you bought the wrong uh, pot for it. Gotta have good drainage always. You can yeah. always add more water, but it's hard to get water out of something. You know, people sometimes take tin foil or the pretty papers during the holiday seasons and wrap the container, which is attractive, but when you 
when you really stop all that water at one, one area, uh, that can be a death sentence, probably even more so. Gotcha. But so. in so many soils too, I would probably improve it. I would add some organic matter to the soil because, you know, that one percent that may be there natively, just isn't very much. And sure. I would probably fertilize these pretty much like I would citrus, which means about three times a year. And if I couldn't find, uh, you won't find a fertilizer just for the white sapote, I would probably use a citrus fertilizer. Gotcha, so something pretty low number like an 888 or a 101010? Or maybe even it could be a 468, lower okay. nitrogen, probably a little higher in phosphorus or potassium. Um, of course, today they're taking phosphorus out of a lot of fertilizers, so it might just be a nitrogen and a potassium source, and that probably would be okay. Um, I say this one's a little tall, a little gangly, but eventually it'll thicken out. It could be anywhere from 15 foot tree, and there have been some reported monsters that got up near 50. Mm. So that's pretty big. That's really big. So yeah. most so, of the books describe them as being mid-size. So again, um, just like any other plant that you buy, think about what it's going to be, not the size of the plant that you planted when it was a baby. Excellent point to bring out. We talk about harvesting fruit. Remember, if you put this over your patio or porch area and you get a ton of fruit with this, or let's say the mulberry, which we talked about earlier, you may even want to put some plastic down so that you can harvest that fruit easier. And if you've got a, a patio, you may not want to get it stained. If you've mm -hmm. got something like a mulberry that has that dark, uh, you know, blue, uh, purple juice, you know, so those are things that people don't think about. And just how big does the root system get? You know, this is kind of an area where it can can move but if you put a, a tree that gets to be 40 or 50 feet and you put it next two feet from your driveway there's a good chance you're going to have some, some problems. shifting yeah and people don't seem to think about what's going to be in 10 years yeah again we, we tend to live in the moment which is fine for the moment but uh, uh, if we do a little bit of uh, careful planning then we can try to avoid a lot of the pitfalls that other people make which is one of the reasons we have the show is to help you uh, try to not make the same mistakes that everyone makes. Um, the other thing I noticed going back to this tree is again they've used some nice loose string here and just like when we did the segment at Sunken Gardens with the staghorn fern, um, not dissimilar just as you know we're not supporting the same kind of load but they've made sure to use a nice loose string here so it doesn't injure the plant and, uh, and I like seeing that. They've made sure that the loops are big and, mm -hmm. and allow for, the, for some expansion here. Because just like uh, when you're you know, building a deck, you're going to have expansion and contraction uh, depending on how hot it is outside. And so this is, this is some good forethought that they've had here. So when you're trying to make a plant go vertical, mm -hmm. um, I think that it's really important that people remember not to injure the thing that they're trying to help correct. Right, and if you do use hard wire or something, a lot of people will cut up little sections of hose, old hose, maybe four to six inches, run your wire through that so that there again, you use that sort of as the buffer. Uh, if you need something a little more uh, right. sturdy than let's say just string, which you might sure. on a bigger tree. Yeah, you definitely would, I, I think on a bigger tree, but on this, uh, uh, I'm calling this you know, a stick tree, uh, but uh, you, you can get away with using uh, lesser materials like string, but uh, yeah, on the staghorn fern, you needed uh, you needed steel chain. So. Yeah, you need something big. So depending on the size of the job, this one's still kind of a, a baby to an adolescent. So, Absolutely. you know, once it gets bigger, it's hard to think of this thing having a good sized trunk, but that will happen one of these days. Sure. Well, I, it's an interesting specimen and the uh, uh, caterpillars seem to love it. They're happy. <laughs>